we have our main speakers. Now I was going to do my own research and get some silly pictures like I do with main of all, all our main speakers, but guess what? They've done it themselves. <laughs> so during the slide you'll see some silly pictures, but before I do I want to tell you a story about Dave to get my own back for earlier. You be careful because I can do so. <laughs> Let's move on. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll skip the funny stories from Bangalore that involve Dave being sick the day after. And we will... Uh, <laughs> We'll, we'll move on past that. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah okay. Um, guys, th I hope you enjoy this talk. I'm really looking forward to it. I've seen part of the presentation. These are two really smart guys. They work for IBM. They're, you know, Dave's based at uh, uh, Shop Direct in Speak. Ian's all over the country. But we're really lucky to grab the both of them. Um, I really am excited about this. Let's have a round of applause for IBM! Fantastic. Thank you very much. And uh, what a great event so far. Really, really enjoyed it and appreciate the, uh, the, the flashers. <laughs> uh, much so. It's a bit of a struggle to refer to them as that with a straight face. Um, and uh, also, I, I'd like to forgive the rock guys in advance for uh, basically stealing all of the words that we've got in our presentation and putting it in theirs. Um, but uh, enough of that. So we're, we're going to tell you a bit of a, uh, a, a three-part story. So we're going to talk a bit about AI and Watson and, and what's really going on. What is it? Um, what, why we think it's important. By the way, uh, we know that there's a marketplace of this stuff out there. Uh, Watson's not the only uh, AI that you, that you can get access to and do stuff with, but it's the one we know about. So <laughs> that's what we're going to talk about. Um, and... Um, uh, so after we've gone through that, we're going to talk a little bit about a story of a, an app that uh, I, I'm going to say we, but I'm being a bit generous to myself because basically I kind of set him up and then Dave had to do it all. Um, but that we that we built using uh, using Watson um, at a, uh, at a <laughs> it's a bit redundant just to say a client, isn't it? But, yeah, uh, <laughs> you can say it's shop direct now. <laughs> I think everyone knows, don't they? Um, so we, we, we built this app to solve a particular problem that, uh, at, at, uh, at Shop Direct, um, and we're going to tell you the story of that. And it's going to be a bit about how we did it and, and the kind of process of building it, but also then the approach we took to testing. And, um, and then, um, as Lee alluded to earlier, you're all going to tell us uh, how we did the testing bit very, very wrong, and we really have no idea what we're doing. And then you can explain to us what we should have done. So uh, that'll, be, uh, that'll be where we finish. So um, the machines are coming. We, we did debate for quite some time about what we we're going to call this, this talk. And then we looked at the website and Lee had kindly already named it for us. <laughs> the machines are coming. So uh, uh, I'd like to modify Lee's title very slightly. The machines are coming, but don't worry, it's going to be OK. <laughs> OK, so um, uh, the funny pictures. Uh, um, so that's, that's us. <laughs> I, I'm Ian, that's me first thing one morning. That's him on a normal day and that's me before I found out I was presenting here. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if you want to get in touch with me, you can. Uh, that's my email address and I'm on Twitter. Um, uh, please don't believe that I'm Ian Duncan Smith. I'm really nothing like him. <laughs> I'd like to, if any of the people in this audience are the people that keep tweeting me, just stop, okay? <laughs> If you want to get in touch with Dave, there's his fax number. <laughs> but at, at, at this point, Dave realises that trusting me to do all the slides might have been a mistake. Um, although, actually, we, he has now uh, joined the 1990s and has an email address as well, where you can, you can get in touch with him. So, uh, as you know, we work for IBM. Sorry, IBM. And... Um, as we've also said, we're going to talk to you a bit about artificial intelligence. Um, although at IBM, we like to use the term cognitive computing, which actually is, is, is slightly, has slightly different overtones. Um, although, equally, you, someone once said that if IBM marketing had been in charge of sushi, it would be called raw dead fish. So uh, <laughs> you have to make your own decision about, about that. Um, but cognitive computing is kind of a bit of a subset, really, really of, of AI. Um, but for years um, and decades, we've kind of dreamed about interacting with computers by talking to them. And there's been loads of science fiction about the various consequences that that might have. 
Um, so on one hand you've got uh, Captain Kirk, the Enterprise's computer, very factual, very to the point. Um, does anyone actually not know who that is? Thank God. <laughs> There's so many jokes that just, will just fall flat if you don't know who that is. Um, on the other hand, we've got C-3PO, who has a purpose. He's a, a language specialist, but actually is a sort of a bit of a worry wart and, and, and uh, can uh, address himself to general purpose problems, such as um, which way to go in, in the desert when you're lost. And finally, a uh, final example there, HAL 9000, um, who went crazy and tried to kill everyone. So uh, lots of different views there of, of artificial intelligence, if you like. Uh, talking to computers doesn't always go particularly well. Does anyone not know what this is? Nobody. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> uh, um, Dave assured me that there would be this whole younger generation here that would never have, uh, uh, wouldn't know what that is. So that's uh, actually one of the Star Trek movies. And um, uh, Mr. Scott there, the engineer, has been told, has decided he needs to use a computer in the 20th century for something. And so he talks to it and the, no, nothing happens. And then uh, the, the guy there points to the mouse and says, you have to use this. So he picked it up and talked to the, the mouse. <laughs> That was probably a bit laborious for, for the, the, how good it was. Um, <laughs> you were right and I was wrong. <laughs> you were right and I was wrong. Um, I won't ever say Get that again to, that. to you. Yeah. <laughs> Get used to that, thanks. I don't know why I repeat things you say, because then they get recorded on this microphone. <laughs> Your jokes could be going unnoticed, you know, yeah. if I wasn't repeating them all. Uh, does anyone know what this is? Chess. <laughs> Excellent. More specifically? Yes, yeah, so that is actually absolutely right. Beat Blue um, and having just beaten Gary Kasparov, who was the world's grandmaster in chess at that time. And um, IBM uh, built Deep Blue as a result of something they call a grand challenge. And so what this is, is that every so often, people, someone in, senior in IBM gets a B in their bonnet about, wouldn't it be uh, really cool to do X? And in this case, X was build a chess computer that can beat a human. Because at that time, it was, very, it was doubted that such a thing was, was actually even possible to, to, to beat a, a human chess player at that, that kind of level. And um, I don't think anyone's really pointing at Deep Blue to, to describe it as AI. Um, although actually it was trained as much as it was programmed because there was, um, it, it was actually uh, trained with some, some 20,000 games or something, catalog of games, which it used to evaluate its, uh, the numbers in its decision uh, engine about when you were balancing multiple uh, objectives, which one to pick. So uh, there, there was some training involved in it. But at the end of the 90s, uh, IBM was starting to think, well, we've done this now, and we want to have, what's our next grand challenge going to be? And uh, something came along. Um, an IBM software vice president was standing in, um, in uh, was sitting, actually, in a bar in... Uh, um, this story is going horribly wrong already. <laughs> uh, it's not a joke about someone going into a bar. Um, <laughs> he, he was eating a, a dinner with his team in a, in a restaurant. And um, at some particular point, everybody in the restaurant cleared out and went to the bar. See, there was a bar. Um, and um, he was, this guy was kind of saying to the team, well, what, what's this? Where have they all gone? And it turned out that a guy called Ken Jennings was having the longest ever streak of wins in this quiz game, Jeopardy. Does anyone not know Jeopardy? Um, and to be honest, I didn't know Jeopardy because it's American. <laughs> So uh, um, even though uh, no one's really stuck their hand very high that I've seen, although my glasses are crap, so you know who knows what's going on at the back. But um, Jeopardy is a game, a quiz show, where the quiz master gives you the answer, and then you have to figure out what the question was. And Jeopardy has very, is full of puns and wordplay. It's uh, uh, the clues, which is what they call the, the, the answers, are, uh, are generally quite, they, they get, very, the questions are very difficult. I'll show you a little bit of video in a minute, actually, to illustrate this a bit. But um, this IBM guy said to his team, wouldn't it be great if we could build a computer that could win at Jeopardy? And uh, there was a lot of uh, blowing through teeth and the usual kind of thing of, uh, oh, that'll never work. I'm not, not sure that's even possible. Um, but they put a team together, and in 2000, 
and 11, they actually got there. And the reason it took them such a long time is that it's really hard to understand natural language and uh, be able to interpret it to the level where you can take action or answer questions based on it. And I've got an example of this. So here's a sentence, fly over the boat with the red bow. So um, you've probably got a mental picture a bit like this. So there's somebody in a balloon flying over a boat and the boat has a red bow. But actually, what if it really means flying over the boat but with a red bow? Well, what if the bow is on the boat? It still works, doesn't it? <laughs> could be a weapon. And that could be a fly, a giant fly. <laughs> and the fly could be wearing the bow, or maybe it could be learning the violin. <laughs> But the funny thing is, all those meanings, all of those meanings from that one sentence, and we know, because we're humans, we've had a lot of practice, that actually only a couple of those really make sense. Clearly, in normal usage, it would be very unusual to be talking about a fly that was playing a violin while hovering over a boat. So that, that's, that's not something that's part of human experience, generally. So, so we, we're able to filter a lot of that stuff, but computers don't have that kind of context. And so that kind of sentence is really, really hard for a computer to understand. Um, and actually, I've got another one. So in this one, a policeman is helping a dog bite victim. <laughs> They're ahead of you. So, so, so there he is, he's clearly not very happy being bitten by the dog, and there's the policeman coming to help him. And in that sentence, you can see that policeman and dog bite victim and nouns and helps is a verb. <laughs> Does anyone like to guess what's coming? <laughs> what if bite was a verb? Yes, you got it. <laughs> I don't know who actually drew this picture, but they must have had a whale of a time with it. So again, you interpret this right, rightly and you've got, you know, a really quite kind and caring view of law enforcement. Interpret it like that. That's a kind of different kind of law enforcement that um, probably uh, you, you would be less desirable. I like the way I hedged that, probably less <laughs> desirable. Um, so, as I said, in 2011, they solved a lot of these kind of problems. Um, and uh, they, they, there was this um, appearance by Watson on Jeopardy. And I've got you a, a one minute kind of video clip of this just so you can get the idea of Jeopardy. And also you can see some of what's going on in Watson when, when, it was, uh, when, when, when the questions are being answered. So uh, hopefully the sound is going to magically work and uh, Lee's head's going to be blown off because he's right next to the speaker. <laughs> <laughs> Going through that, you just need to change your sound to go through that. Go on. Kill me now. All right, all right. Abort, abort. <laughs> I'll just change the sound to go through that. That, that will be. <laughs> Should have tested it. Hashtag. <laughs> so we got it. That's it. Right. Cool. So Let's go. I was just setting this up again, and then Ian ran me through this video a little while ago and failed to point out what was going on at the bottom of the screen. At the bottom of the screen, you will see how confident Watson is about the various possible answers. Key point that he assumes we'll all spot, but I didn't when he was showing it earlier. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, you're not. <laughs> is there anything else I'm doing wrong that you'd like to tell me about? <laughs> Plenty. <but I'm> <laughs> That's it. I'm going. No, no. Okay. Let's try that. Let's try that again. So here's the video of Jeopardy. Hopefully with audible noise this time. For 800. While Maltese borrows many words from Italian, it developed from a dialect of this Semitic language. Watson, what is Arabic? You are right. 1,000, same category. Aeolic, spoken in ancient times, was a dialect of this. Watson, what is ancient Greek? Yes. Breaking news. For 800. Gambler Charles Wells is believed to have inspired the song, The Man Who Did This. 
at Monte Carlo. Watson. What is broke the bank? You got it. Same category, 1,000. Nearly 10 million YouTubers saw Dave Carroll's clip called This Friendly Skies Airline Breaks Guitars. Watson. What is United Airlines? Yes. One buck or less for 800. 99 cents got me a four pack of Italy coasters from this Swedish chain. Brad, what is IKEA? Yes. So there you go, just a, a little clip, but uh, you can see um, a, a few things from that. So one of them, as Dave alluded to, and I've now reached the point in my, uh, my talk where I was going to say this. <laughs> um, yeah, tell them before. Yeah. But you can see the, uh, the, the confidence levels. And actually, the thing that, that, that makes that interesting is that um, natural language processing and applications that use it, are, it's non-deterministic. You can't, you can't know what's going to happen, and you can't always uh, uh, compose, I guess, a really good, or, or, or a comprehensive, anyway, set of test cases to, uh, to try and uh, get to the bottom of it. Anyway, we'll talk more about that when we get to uh, our, our own bit of story. So, so where are we going with this? Um, we've had a research project that's been able to win a Jeopardy. So what's next? Well, obviously, world domination. <laughs> um, Dave actually promised me that uh, uh, young people in the audience wouldn't know what this was. Does everyone in the audience know? If you don't know what this was, put your hand up. Oh, that's not fair. Oh, somebody! <laughs> there you go. You, you don't, Thanks, Lena. Dave, go. Dave will pay you later for that. Uh, <laughs> that help. So Dave made me put this in. So that's a slightly different variant on the, uh, on, 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 on the AI uh, takes over the world. Um, sort of, uh, I'm trying to think of the word, meme, maybe. So these things are examples of what's called artificial general intelligence. Clearly they're fictional examples. And the reason that they're fictional examples is because no one's done this yet. And the reason no one's done it yet is because it's, at the moment anyway, too hard. So I think um, uh, there was a discussion of 2040 earlier as being a, a time frame for something like this. Um, that feels about right. Maybe, um, but certainly not in the immediate future. So if you look at what IBM is trying to do with Watson, it's not this. It's very explicitly not this. So what, what you'll see from IBM is that, that, that we've written down now three kind of principles for what we're trying to do. So one of them is about purpose. And this one is really, really important. The purpose of artificial intelligence or cognitive systems are to help people do things, not replace them. And there's a really, some really great examples of, of the way that this is, this is happening at the moment. But it's, it's to, to augment human capabilities, not, not to, to, to get rid of humans. The next thing is about transparency. And so this, uh, the biggest thing in here is about data. Um, IBM is, IBM's customers tend to be uh, enterprises of different sizes and um, those enterprises want to keep hold of their own data and so this was uh, one of the things was we don't have to you don't have to share this data and have someone else using it for any, purp any, any purposes but it's also important that people can trust systems that have uh, cognitive uh, capabilities and that there's an understanding of which bits of the system have that and which bits are, are, are sort of done in a more traditional way and then finally skills so IBM is committed to helping build the skills in, in, uh, of, of, of people to be able to uh, operate in this new kind of world and there's various stuff that's going on. But the reason it seemed necessary to write down a set of principles like this is that there's a ton of, of sort of uh, ways in which people have started to see that, that this whole area can m maybe go wrong and uh, we only have to go back to uh, Skynet to, uh, to kind of uh, think about some of those scenarios. But um, there are lots of kind of ethical questions ar around this area and um, so the industry um, is kind of getting together so there's this thing which is really catchy name partnership on AI to benefit people and society um, so you can uh, you can go to their website but basically it's an uh, it's the sort of big hitters IBM but also Microsoft Google Facebook the big uh, people doing work in this area getting together to try and make sure that the work they're doing really is benefiting society and just earlier this week these this 
set of principles came out. Um, I couldn't figure out why it was called that, and then I found out actually that's the name of the place where they, <laughs> where they had the meeting that, that, that resulted in these. Um, there are rather a lot of them, um, and I'm not going to go through them all. Um, did you, so if you, you got, didn't get that, there'll be a, a quiz later. Um, the, the, main, the main point is that there are a lot of uh, people from large organisations and small who are signatories to this set of principles, which is designed to kind of lay down a way of, um, of trying to govern where we're going with all this and try to avoid Skynet. Um, although I think they're hedging their, their, their bets a bit. I particularly like that an arms race in lethal autonomous weapons <laughs> should be avoided. <laughs> If I, was, if I was writing that down as a sort of requirement, I think it would be must rather than should. <laughs> but um, I don't want to criticise. I think actually it's, really, it's a really important thing that the industry that's kind of working on this thinks about some of these, these problems. And um, uh, that's t your turn that's for your story. All you oh, right. Oh, okay. So, yes, I said before that I used to be a tester. I also used to be a developer once upon a time. <laughs> And should you be flying on an A310, <laughs> some of my software is controlling that thing. Um, we're going back more years than I care to think of. Um, I wrote some flight management software that actually takes control of the plane, not during landing, not during takeoff, during the easy bit in the sky. For many years afterwards, whenever an Airbus crashed, I'd have a panic attack. I really would. Because <laughs> you immediately think, oh, I hope that wasn't me. When you're dealing with AI, you're at another level beyond that. That's my story. I've got them quiet. That's because you're talking quietly, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, th there's no doubt. And, you know, if you look at uh, some of the, uh, the autonomous driving and stuff like that, you know, cars with autonomous driving software are going to have to make decisions between accidents. And, who, you know, who's in charge of deciding? If I'm in, my, if I'm in a car that I've paid for, um, should, and, and, and the car has a choice of running me into a wall or into two pedestrians, you know, that, that, that's a real genuine sort of moral dilemma there. And people who are writing that code and training those AI systems have to, have to grapple with it. So anyway, uh, a bit of a, a divert onto the ethics of it, but I think it, it is very important. So um, after we, we, we did the game show, uh, we thought we were going to, uh, to try and use Watson for something real. Um, and um, what was the thing that was picked was uh, oncology. Or, or, or so what, uh, Watson was uh, redeveloped. First, well, I had to do a lot of re-engineering because basically it was a single user system that filled quite a lot of rooms. So they had to re-engineer it to make it multi-user. So it was a big kind of just that kind of activity. But then they thought the first big project they, they wanted to work on was delivering something to help cancer doctors. And um, so this is a bit of user interface for, from that, which is probably um, not, not that interesting in itself. But uh, the idea was that uh, Watson read every single medical research paper on cancer, um, cancer research that's pretty much ever been published. And it um, also uh, took in a load of, loads of uh, results of trials and tests of things, it took in a ton of documentation and um, is, is now able, if by looking at a patient's medical record and interacting with their doctor, to make recommendations about treatment that uh, it's still the doctor's decision, but the recommendations um, are, it's actually quite life changing, really, in, in a real sense. Um, cancer research papers come out at an incredible speed. They come out, there's, there's, I don't know, tens of them a month. It's impossible for a doctor to keep up with reading all of that. And um, if they could keep up with reading all of that, remembering everything that's in it would be, a, uh, would be a nightmare. And so having something that's read all that stuff, knows it, and can help you apply it in a real life situation is very powerful. And there's great, some great videos knocking around on YouTube. Uh, what, what I'll do is I'll, I'll make sure there's a list of links of interesting things around this that I'll... I'll sent to Lee to, to distribute. So I think there's some quite interesting side tracks that we're, we're not taking, but that you might be interested in. And again, um, in, on this sort of screen, you probably can't read this at the back, so sorry, um, but there's a, a set of different uh, suggested therapies. So on the menu at the side, there's a kind of journey of uh, um, progress and latest 
therapy and therapy history and things like that. But this is a recommendation about what to do. And uh, there's the, com the middle column there is, is about confidence. So again, it's got a load of options, but it's very confident in that one. And it, the transparency principle comes out in that as well, because the doctor, when they're looking at that, they don't just say, oh, well, Watson says it, so, you know, computer says yes. <laughs> um, they, they, um, the doctor can then drill down into why has Watson said that and see the excerpts from the medical papers that have, that have caused that decision to be made. So it's a, it's a, I mean, it's a really great example, and it's really one of these making, making a difference to the world things. Um, that, 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 that's really very good. Um, so after doing that, um, I think a lot of people are expecting uh, that they would now pick another grand uh, sort of big application like this, but maybe in a different field or something to do. And actually they have been doing that kind of thing. But what they, what the, the main thing that they've done since, since this started is that they've now taken it, Watson, and decomposed it into lots of smaller services and made those available for... Uh, to be used by anyone who goes on the on the website and signs up, and so this is a screenshot of uh, of, of uh, again what you would see if you did that. And again, the resolution is probably a bit a bit low to, for for it to be readable. But um, one of the uh, that there's all sorts of different kinds of services on here. So personality insights, you f you can feed Watson a bit of text, and it will send back a some kind of personality. Uh, uh, ratings based on uh, some science in that area um, and then you can use that to find out whether the person that wrote that was angry and then you can do something different with that person than if they if, if than, than if they were they were happy so you can you can deal with people differently based on based on their mood or their sort of speech to text and text to speech um, but there's one the one we're going to really focus in on now is called conversation and what's in conversation is what you can use to take that technology that did the, 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 the one jeopardy, the technology that was, was helping the cancer doctors, and actually do something with it yourself. Um, and that's what we did. So I'm going to hand over to Dave, who will now tell that story. And uh, it will become apparent when you listen to him that it was mostly him that did it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I got f the, the, the blame for this. Okay, so IBM Roots, cognitive assistant. So. This is, this is the application that I ended up developing, or training, if that's a better word. Mm -hmm. um, before I go into it, let me tell you a little bit about the problem we're trying to solve. Uh, not a grand scale problem like Ian's been trying to talk about. It's not going to save the world. It might save us some time. Um, I'm not going to name names at this point, but I work for an IT company at a, on, on an outsourced account. Okay? <laughs> Prior to outsourcing, as many of you will know, if I need something doing in an organization, I go and tap Bobby on the, co on the shoulder and say, could you start that, restart that database for me? I need it quickly. And Bobby will do it. He'll drop what he's doing, especially if I'm bigger than him, and he will do it. In an outsourced account, life doesn't work like that. In an outsourced account, you tap, but, well, Bobby isn't there. He's gone. So you tap somebody else on the shoulder and say, I need a database restarting, what do I do? And the answer is, I'm a tester, I don't know. So you tap somebody else on the shoulder and say, ah, yes, I had that problem. Um, you need to call the service desk to get that done. Hello, this is the service desk, how can I help you? You need a database starting? Certainly. Um, is it in response to a problem, because we'll raise a ticket and get it sourced around? Or is it part of a change that you're trying to make? In which case, you'll need to go to the change approval board and it'll take a week or so. No, 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 no. It's in a test environment. I need to get my test environment ready. I need the database restarting so I've got a clean start. Can't help you, sorry. And so you go round the houses and eventually you find the test environments manager. And he says, okay, um, you need to fill in a form. You need to use this tool. It needs to go round there. We should be able to get to it in about three weeks time. So you escalate and you go in to speak to the, the big boss of the outsourcing organization. You say, I won't call it, I'll call him Bobby. I won't use real names. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, can I have my database restarted? It's really urgent. Yeah, hang on a second. I'll phone Bobby's replacement. Can you do it in five minutes? Great. And that's how it works. So you've wasted loads of time. All this tries to do is give you the shortcuts, help you go to the right place with the right tools and the right forms to get a rapid response, okay? 
So, this is a screenshot of what Roots looks like when you first go in. Uh, you're learning about this pretty early. It was launched on Tuesday this week. So we've been through a, a testing cycle, which I'll cover off in a bit more detail. But literally, this was launched on Tuesday, hence the, the fancy welcome screen. Um, so the idea is you log on, you type in completely free format in natural language what you're looking for. You may have some dialogue back. It'll give you an answer. It may give you a link to a document or a form. Um, and, and then, most importantly, you need to say how satisfied you were. It's not like Jeopardy. And I'll touch on, if I forget, somebody shout out what about confidence ratings in a minute. Okay, so building this was, uh, was interesting. <laughs> uh, it, uh, I, as I said before, I used to do development in things like assembler. <laughs> It's not like coding an assembler. Uh, it is, as it says there, it's training, not coding. Okay, I needed to define what I'm trying to do. First, define some intents. These are effectively verbs. What is my end user's purpose? Why is he on there? I want to start something. I want to cancel something. I want to change something. The intents are the verbs. So I've got a series of real verbs there. I want to escalate, I want to request a service, I want to fix something. Uh, so you define your intents, get them right. It can be iterated. Uh, I can add new ones, greetings, hello and goodbye were added quite late on because I thought it would be polite <laughs> and because somebody tried it <laughs> and got an unhelpful response. Um, and you need, then the second step is dream up some sentences that correspond to that <coughs> intent. Give Watson a handle to start on. Make them as varied as possible. Be as imaginative as you can, because no matter how imaginative you are, you can guarantee when you give it to the users, they'll ask things in a completely different way. Next, define the entities. These are the nouns. This is the database. This is, I want an architect or a developer. And again, uh, it's not helpful perhaps that acronyms at the top, IBM and acronyms, <laughs> We specialize in those, and I didn't know what half of those meant. Um, so you, you, you have a series of possible wordings for each of the uh, entities that you want, and you group them. So personal items might be my laptop, my computer, my phone, my, my user ID, something that belongs to an individual. Whereas further down off the bottom, just off the bottom, technical components might be a server, a database, uh, a Windows box, that kind of thing. You then plug these together into dialogues. Spelt the American way, not the English way. Yeah, we're an IBM, American company. And this is where you bring those two together and you define effectively a nested set of uh, flows between the intents and the entities down to an answer or further dialogue to take you to an answer. So my example earlier about the, uh, the database reset, the answer depends on whether you're looking at production or at test. So it would branch out at that point. That's the complicated bit. That's the bit that took all the time. That's the bit that got me cursing and swearing the day I was building it. I, I was working joking. from home. I'm not <laughs> joking. I got into trouble. <laughs> I was working from home that day. Um, down at the bottom here on each of the screens, I did forget to add something. We've got little YouTube videos. If you follow those links, it will take you to standard intense entities and dialogue definitions, should you be interested. Um, in those examples, it's about driving a car. The intents are, I want to switch something on or off. The entities are things like wipers, lights, radio. And the dialogue then says, how loud do you want your rock music? Things like that. Okay? Okay, so back to roots. So I developed something. I put in a load of questions. I start testing it and I'm thinking, yeah, this confidence rating's useful. I'm getting good answers. The helpful, unhelpful buttons weren't on there at that point. I'm getting good answers. I'm going to get a pilot group to have a go at this. So I've done my testing. I am not, I'm not shop direct. I know some of the answers, otherwise I wouldn't have built the damn thing. A 
soon as they started using it, they asked different questions in different ways about different things, and we started to hit the jeopardy problem. Change. I want to change my mind. I want to request a change. I want an emergency change, which doesn't mean change at all, it means a fix. Back to the drawing board, rework it. At that point, we realized what we really need is to be able to get the user to judge how good the response was. Okay? What we found around confidence ratings in the early days, it's completely misleading. Watson is brilliantly confident and totally wrong a lot of the time. <laughs> you have to train this beast and you have to train it a lot. Um, so we had a group of, I'm making it up now, about a dozen people using it for two months. And gradually you could see the helpful responses increase from about 25% up to about 85% now. Okay? Um, so getting feedback is critical. We've launched it. Um, I looked after one day, it was sitting at around 80%, so I'm reasonably confident. There was some twerp that asked it the time. Unfortunately, it came back with a stock answer that said, it's actually this one, I'm sorry, I don't understand your question. I can answer questions about yada, 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 yada. I wish what it said was, we've spent billions of pounds on this bloody thing. I'm not a speaking clock. Get a watch. <laughs> I might still build that answer in. <laughs> There's quite a few things like that that Dave's got still <laughs> He'd like to build in in response to some questions. So, getting feedback is key. So, what we also found was sometimes people would click unhelpful. It's a judgment call. I've got a response. It's okay. It's a little bit helpful, but I want more. Which button do I click? So, we now say click unhelpful and tell me why. And we capture that. Now Watson's clever. It can learn automatically from that feedback. It can automatically learn to revise what it understands by change. How, how the phraseology of a particular question, I want a database restart. Please restart my database. Um, my database is down. I want to get my test environment up and running and all the database is clean. They all mean the same thing. It can learn. <laughs> yes, we have got the next slide. Uh, we decided not to let it learn automatically, partly because I didn't want Roots becoming a Man United fan. <laughs> it's my baby, it's not doing that. <laughs> um, and partly because of this. So, Microsoft's API uh, launched, and within one day, it became a horror. <laughs> Uh, sober headline from a particularly Dave. sober headline. So the secret <laughs> is, get feedback. I'm not so sure, what, as Ian pointed out when we changed the slide earlier, don't swallow it whole with that headline, might not quite go right. <laughs> um, but, but the key thing is, don't just take the feedback and incorporate it. Keep the human element in here. It comes back to this, this is augmented assistance for humans it doesn't don't allow it to take over you can never pr quite predict where it will end up as Microsoft found out so we're back here on a weekly basis we go through all the helpful and unhelpful feedback uh, and we decide how much of that to let Watson learn from and how much of it to place in the bin it's uh, anonymous the use which is great. It means it's easy to get onto, it's easy to use. Uh, it also gives me an excuse not to put anything sensitive in there. I'm so, you, you wanted to know about the contract? How much we're charging for a service? I'm sorry, I can't tell you. That's a good <laughs> cop-out. My regret is I still don't know who asked the bloody thing the time. Okay? Um, so, key message there is we haven't We've learned a lot along the way, but testing it is not something that a normal test team can do. You've really got to get it out to the users as soon as possible and get them to test it because it's non-deterministic. Stuff isn't right or wrong. It's good enough or not good enough. And that means testing this is different as was developing it. And fixing it, actually. And fixing it is, yeah. Going do back a lot and of head figuring scratching. out why it 
went a particular way on a particular question. That's, so. Actually, that's not too bad. You've got some tools to work out where it went, and you can start to understand why. But then, how do I persuade it to go down the right route without messing up all the other answers? It gets yeah. quite complicated. So, the question for the audience is, knowing what you know now, and you're all testers with a lot of experience, I'm guessing 500 years, no more than 1,000 years worth of experience, That's testing experience, wrong. yeah? yeah? <laughs> I'm glad you picked him. <laughs> Any thoughts on what this means for testing going forward? Quick question, you said it's about an 80% accuracy. Yep. Guess human beings, what would the accuracy be? So, so 80%, I'm not, I've not reported on the confidence accuracy from Watson. 80% accuracy is what the humans have judged it at. Right. So, the thing of, is, if you ask a human being, they might get it wrong. Yeah, 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 I know. So, you know, so, 100% unachievable, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. A computer or a human being. Compu so, yeah, exactly. So it's 80% with a human, and therefore is it... So maybe a better way of putting that is 80% is the satisfaction score from the users. So 80% of the time they are saying it's, it's given me a sensible answer and I can go with that. 20% of the time they've gone, it has got a clue. But is that because they're going out of the bounds or is it because... Uh, well, <coughs> yeah, if they go out of the bounds they get... I'm sorry, I don't understand your question. Or if they go, there, there are a couple of other variants of that answer, but there are a number of those in the system. There must be cases where they stay in the bounds and they still get that. So is that the 80 Yeah, so yeah. So, so when I launch this on Tuesday, I encourage people, if you get a funny answer, rephrase and try again. Uh, I want to start my database in a test environment to get the right answer. We'll get you there immediately rather than going through a load of dialogue. Um, I want to know that what the time is on server X might get you a sensible answer, if that's what the idiot was looking for. Has anybody got Alexa? Uh, sorry, Amazon Echo. Yeah. Okay, so it sounds like when I use my Amazon Echo, I can say a question that won't understand it. When I ask it differently, and I almost use the Twitter rule of bringing the characters down and just making it as simplistic as possible, Alexa usually gets it. But if I try and rattle off too much and use erm or pause, it just completely loses yeah. the plot. So it sounds like it's the way you ask the question. It is the way you ask the question. I mean, this is a written interface, which helps. Sp spoken interface is obviously the next step to go to. Um, <laughs> Maybe you're also training your users. They're going to learn how to get yeah. helpful answers. Absolutely. Like Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. yeah, exactly. if people who think helpful, they're going to come and use it again. People who think it's unhelpful, just not going to I'll find out who they are and I'll make them use it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's uh, all about the intents, how you define an Alexa, how the Alexa works is like you, you tell Alexa, you know, yep. um, you know, Alexa, play some song. So the various people will say, if I say, play some song, and somebody will say something else. Yeah. So Alexa will take all those things and, and learns over a period of time and it just whoever says it is going to play a song. So that's similar to the application. Yeah. Look at it. Yeah. Alexa put weird L on. More intense and more <laughs> So that. Yeah. And then it does the job when you ask. Well, I guess if it's anonymous, you've got an even bigger challenge because Alexa can learn my Welshisms and things. <laughs> I guess I don't know if it's that clever, but. Have you possibly. tried this yet? <laughs> <laughs> I'm but sorry, I don't understand. Uses sort of what it normally asks for, what it, how it normally speaks, and be a bit more accurate. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, that's the advantage of the APIs that Ian was talking about. We've already got almost a plug-in uh, spoken interface. Speech-to-text was one of those APIs and vice versa. Can, can I ask a question to the room? For those of you that have seen what you've seen today about how you train IBM Watson rather than test it, I stupidly, before I spoke to the guys and saw this, I just thought you plugged it in and it just went on its way. Did anybody else think that with IBM Watson? Did anyone else think you just plug it in and there's a little maintenance afterwards? Because this looks like it's continuous maintenance. You're continuously training it. You're yeah. having to look at the answers yeah. coming back. You then yep. have to feed that training back into IBM Watson. Did anybody think like me? It was just simplistic and you just plugged it in and off it went. Am I the only one? But isn't okay. that the difference between the Microsoft example and this where you're saying you're going to analyse... Yeah. The, the yeah. We might get to the point. How do you test it going forward now that it's always learning? So 
again, it comes down to the users. I don't think, unless we were making major changes, we wouldn't go through a test cycle anymore. We're basically testing production, if you like. Um, I would hope that we will get to the point where it changes less frequently, otherwise I'll never get my day job back. Um, and that we'll be able to review Watson's confidence ratings, which are getting closer to the human, um, and we'll be able to let, did I say Alexa's confidence ratings there? Watson's confidence <laughs> ratings, <laughs> Freudian slip. Um, There's Alexa behind Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, damn, I've been spotted. I would hope that we can use Watson confidence ratings in the future so that it can start to learn. So long as we sack all the Man United fans, I'm happy. But I guess the, the way you could <laughs> test it is if you, if you start off by saying this now works and it's learned all the time, you could retest, you could sort of regression test it by saying that yeah. always has to work. If that doesn't work, then tell me about the results <coughs> change. Yeah. So, we were, so uh, I was exaggerating slightly. We will always do a, a degree of testing. We've got a stock set of questions that we would run through. Um, Typically, when we go through this, we see all the helpful and unhelpful answers, and those in which the user hasn't bothered to say yes or no. They've just abandoned it, um, which we treat as unhelpful, by the way. Um, and, uh, and, and you can run the recent types of questions through as proof. Would it, would it be like useful to do the, the learning by a, not just, say, one set of team? So you, if you use a, a cross-reference of many different people, different levels, different yep. areas, because it has to account for a, a wide lexicon of different things, because somebody, say, high up, might words have been incredibly differently to somebody, yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, somebody uh, who's from up north would word it incredibly Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we did that. We had some of the testers. Paula was involved wherever she's gone. Um, there she is. Paul, Paula came to see me a few times and cursed. <laughs> we had developers. We had managers. Um, we had a, a, a quite a cross-section. And you're absolutely right. You need uh, different ways of approaching the problem. Paula found all sorts. Of, I think she was the first tester on the system. So she asked a completely different set of questions um, and invariably got told to go to the service desk or the <laughs> so change board. Did you, did you conduct white box and black box testing on, uh, testing on it? So did you, tech, did you have testers testing the code behind the scenes as well no. as it was just... No, there is, there's, there's really no ability to do that. that the, the, the fancy front end is just a bit of um, JSON code, which one of his pals did for me. Um, I guess there was some yes, normal JSON testing code, there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Perhaps. It wasn't assembler. It definitely wasn't assembler. It was, uh, it was not assembler. No. So there was some some normal white box, black box stuff on that that front end, but the back end, it, no, it's 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 black box only. In fact, just to put this in a bit of context, uh, we didn't fire this up as a proper project with uh, um, you know real resources. It was all people and uh, mostly Dave. Yeah. Who, yeah. Who tr who pretty much trained this in in his. Well, uh, we time. fancifully <laughs> like to call it spare time. Um, yeah. And um, so I guess this is probably the result of probably 20 hours of your time. Yeah, um, and maybe more? No, my, no, I was thinking maybe less. Maybe less? Maybe less. I've typically spent an hour a week on this um, since beginning of December. So uh, I guess maybe a bit more on odd weeks. So 10, 15 hours. Yeah, and if it had been a real project with a real... Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, doing formal testing, I guess we probably would learn, you know, more, more than we have, and we wouldn't be arriving quite so blankly to, to ask you for inspiration. But um, the other uh, slightly funny story that, that goes with this is that there's a particular lady on the IBM team who's the, um, the sales exec for... Uh, that was early on. <laughs> go on, go on. A proper married couple. <laughs> I'll yeah. shut up and drink Have the you beer. Have already said this? <laughs> no. I'm sure you did. Um, and this lady is the, the sales exec who's in charge, basically, of the, uh, the whole IBM sales relationship with, uh, with Shop Direct. <laughs> and um, we thought that um, if Watson was really unable to figure out what someone was talking about, that must mean it was a kind of new greenfield kind of thing, and therefore they should take it to her. And um, so we had to kind of tame that a bit. <laughs> Because there were all kinds of things that it was suggesting <laughs> taken to her, and I don't think she would have been very pleased. I, I, I gave the uh, Watson Roots application to my colleagues in the IBM team to do an initial set of testing, <laughs> and they didn't ask the right questions. <laughs> yes. 
And yeah, the answer was go and talk to Silver. <laughs> almost every test. I'm sure she wouldn't. Have I been was accused of only having one answer in the system. <laughs> so, so I'd like to ask a question to the room. So you, you've heard how this was put together. You've heard how the users predominantly tested it. Although Dave tried with some inputs from Paula, but really the real value came from the, the users testing it. How does that make guys in the room feel? So we're testers predominantly in the room, probably 80%. How is this making people feel? There's two guys at the back with their hands up. Do you want to stand up and shout your answers out, guys? Um, basically, that's ex exactly a problem that we've run into a lot in games, however, for PlayStation. Um, the project I was on for the last couple of years was VR um, related. So, a lot of times, the end user would use the product in a way that you don't expect. Um, I guess one example was we had a game. We had these aiming lasers using the headset, and um, the instruction on the screen is look at the uh, look at this object in the corner. So people just stand um, looking forward and look up with their eyes. And they don't turn their head, and uh, the headset requires you to turn. So it, it's about that disconnect between what you expect the user to do and what the user actually yeah. does. So uh, we do a lot of what's called user testing. We have a team down in London, and they bring in. Uh, hundreds of people at a time to actually play the content, um, and, and we gather that data about you know, what does what happens in the in the real world. Basically. We we also found that. Go stand up, mate. <laughs> <laughs> we we also found that putting putting a traditional software tester on 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 a game versus letting the public have a go, it was. You could put 100 people from the real world on a, on a game and set, tell them have a go, try and find something wrong with it. But to put an experienced software tester on a game and ask them to find bugs, you get so much more value out of the one experienced software tester doing 8 to 16 hours versus thousands of hours of untrained, unqualified people having a, having a stab at bug finding. And that's not, that's not to say there's nothing bad against those people. You certainly get the weird, unusual things that as, uh, one person might not find, but a trained software professional, QA professional, will find generally 75, 80%, 80% of those will Okay, I, I think, does anybody use Spotify? Yeah. Okay, so every time I go on Spotify, um, there's obviously the code that learns behind it, what I'm listening to. So I'm a New Order fan, so I listen to New Order. And I think from a, if I was a tester at Spotify, I'm guessing they do something which is looking for a good answer rather than a right answer. So now when I go into Spotify, they put the Smiths up as a band that I'd like to listen to. I flipping well hate the Smiths. <laughs> right. hey. But to them, and, and as a tester, sorry, sorry, I'm not being a Smiths fan. But to a tester oh, in Spotify, that would look like a good answer. Until it hits me, the user, and actually it's an insulting answer. So, you know, and as testers, we're probably, we're going to go down this journey where we go away from right and wrong answers, and we, what, you want me here? Why? Oh, right, okay. Um, <laughs> the camera. Um, and we're going to have to start moving to a world where we look for good answers, instead of, you know, the, the, the right traditional answers. black and white. Yeah. And, you know, the same is on Netflix, the same technology, they're, they're, they're measuring what you're watching, if you're on the film or programme for like 10 seconds to the end, they're measuring everything and then they're trying to put good answers in front of you. So, I think from my, my experience as a tester, you, you have user cases from the business and, and they're quite static, whereas this is very dynamic and it's learning all the time. Mm. So, in this case... In the case when it's on Spotify, having just business cases and use cases probably doesn't, doesn't satisfy the need there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm, sorry, go on. No, no. Could you, could you, you, when you, you know, when you're in a help desk, they record the, the speech that's happening. Could you use your speech to text and then play that through to see if it ends up at the same solution? Or? Uh, you potentially could. Uh, shop director doing something along those lines. I don't want to go too far into that because I'm not sure okay. how public it is. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Okay. I won't go any further. Ask me outside the room. Okay. Is it, is no. <laughs> <laughs> you don't understand what that means. <laughs> you need a shave? <laughs> it, it, you mean to carry on? <laughs> Listen, it's, it's, it's coming up to ten past nine. Um, has anybody got any last thoughts on, oh. on what they've seen today? Um, or any advice or thoughts on how... Testing's going to change regarding what you've seen. At the back, Emma? I've 
I've got more of a question. So, if you've got lots of industries like cyber security firms and medical companies and education firms, do you silo that information and that learning, or could someone manipulate that information and use it all together? Mm -hmm. So, at the moment, the data owned by a particular organisation belongs to them. And so IBM doesn't do any, any back, back office kind of correlation of, of stuff. But I know, I mean, there are other organisations in this area whose business model is propped more around monetizing data, where that might happen. So I, 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 it's hard to make a, a general answer. But I think for IBM's point of view, broadly speaking, if you put your data in here, it's not used for anything else. I think it's part of the third principle that we touched on earlier. Yeah. Okay, we'll, do, just on, do, we'll do these two questions and then we'll finish at the front first. So, so, at the front. so you mentioned earlier about how uh, self-driving cars, uh, the AI inside them have to, uh, would have to make decisions such as, do, do I want to protect this uh, person inside and want to hit the pedestrian mm. and so on. Um, with the, the likes of what we have now, what would stop, because you use the example of, say, Skynet and stuff, but in those sort of, Obviously, that's fictional, but in those instances, it was always the AI coming up with a solution that went against what the original thing was. But what would stop, say, in an IT software scenario, the, it learning and saying it's more important for this to happen than it is this, so making a call that would be not the computer's decision to make that decision, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So what would stop it from going, I know that this is more important than this, so I'm going to make the decision of what is going to happen. Yeah, and I think that's, I mean, it's those principles. I mean, the re, I mean, it, it's a bit sort of bullet pointy, that, that one, but, but those principles about actually how you do this and, and the, you're helping humans rather than take, replacing them, all of that kind of stuff plays in, into that. And I don't think we're by a long shot we've got to the answer yet. Um, you know, we've got an approach that we're talking about and, and those broader principles, but we'll, I think, you know, watch this space, really. And the last question from the back. Ironically, uh, or beautifully, from a rock person. Well, it's Love that. A quick, uh, <laughs> daunting, really. um, you talked about how um, we could approach the testing of AI type systems, but have we thought about the way that AI type systems might change the way that we test? Because, you know, there's all kinds of human uh, involvement in testing, of yep. and the cognitive side of it comes in. I think it's one that may be unanswerable. But it, it's maybe not for tonight, and we'll be here for a long time. But yes, that is absolutely something we're thinking about. How do we get AI to help testers? A lot of time in testing is spent checking your results, planning your tests. It must be able to help. Testers need to be testing, not checking. Yeah. Okay. Um, controversial statements when not. Um, <laughs> so it, it, it is ten past. It's just gone ten past. What I'm going to say is, any more questions for the guys, or any more things that you want to talk about regarding what's been raised in the last sort of forty minutes? You're going to be in the pub with us. Yeah, but. Okay, cool. That's really cool. Shall we have a round of applause for the idea? <laughs>